right, everyone. I want to welcome you here. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Robin Lloyd, and this is sponsored by the Vermont Wilf Gathering. Wilf stands for Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, an international organization with a uh, branch here in Burlington and Rochester. So um, this is kind of a unique event for us and a beautiful venue. Uh, the subject is NATO, pros and cons. Uh, if you've been following the news, you know that since, um, since the Ukraine crisis, NATO has been very much in the news. They held a huge uh, conference in Madrid, Spain, and one of our speakers, was there, but she was mainly outside of the official event at something called No to NATO. Uh, this is Paki Whelan. She's an activist uh, from Northampton. She's a member of Code Pink. She was in charge of the Pink House in Washington, D.C., where I stayed several times and made, uh, made mushroom cookies to give to Kent to uh, our uh, officials uh, on the subject of uh, trying to trying to end the nuclear uh, um, developments that were going on. So um, anyway, here we are, and this is Mike Von Dusen, who uh, lives here right in Rochester. Are you? Yeah, the brick house. Oh. Three, three doors <laughs> down there. Oh, okay, the brick house. He has been <laughs> active in. Yeah. <laughs> he has been uh, an official in the Woodrow Wilson uh, Center and he held various positions, and that's a um, sort of a progressive-leaning think tank. So he's been doing lots of thinking. Pocky has been doing lots of thinking. And uh, did you decide who will go first? I'd love, I'd love the man <laughs> to, uh, who's the, the pros. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Back. Yes, Robin came to, uh, to make... Mushroom cookies instead of mushroom clouds. It's a great idea, and especially in these days where we're, we're thinking about those clouds again, huh? Oh, <laughs> my God. Um, so, uh, so I was, I was interested when, when Robin said, oh, oh, you've gone to Madrid. Why don't you come and talk about your time there uh, with NATO? And then she said, well, let's, let's, I'm inviting someone else. I'm inviting Mike Van Dusen, who, uh, who, has this illustrious um, foreign relations background. And I thought, oh my goodness, now here we could have what we would call a, a clash of paradigms. Uh, the man with the, the insider and the woman outsider. Or we could look at this through a, a more postmodern lens and say, ah, an expansion of the conversation from those the insiders and outsiders and for those of us who uh, who are, are political activists we know that we we need to do both inside and outside don't we and even people who have great foreign relations work know that you need insiders and outsiders That's correct so nobody, nobody in government has all the answers <laughs> but you might so no, no, no. <laughs> So even though you are a consultant to all these government people, you, you, they still don't have all the answers. They do not. Okay, well, I guess we'll have to send you back to D.C. <laughs> but, but meanwhile, so, so yeah, so there's this, this NATO organization. And, and I was trying to remember when, when I first started engaging in conversations with people about NATO, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and, and I had some recollection from, I think, even elementary school. What is NATO? Oh, yes, that was formed to counter the Warsaw Pact. And I thought, well, that good for you, kid. <laughs> you remember a little of your history. And then, uh, as I learned more about NATO today, especially in light of Ukraine and some of the other things that NATO's been involved in, I thought, um, so, so it was a great organization for the Cold War. Uh, and I think most of us are old enough to remember the Cold War. Um, that, that what we had was 
the good guys, that was us, we had the white hats, not blue, but white. Uh, and, and they, of course, were the bad guys with the black hats. And, uh, and, and one of the sad things about that whole time was we all learned that those people with the black hats, especially the Russians, were the bad guys. They were the biggest, baddest guys. And even though most of us learned along the way that it wasn't really the Russians who were the bad guys, it was, you know, various propagandas and, and that underneath it, we were all people. And, uh, but yet, when this Ukraine thing happened again, lo and behold, look at all the people who said, ah, oh, it's the Russians. And, and those early learnings came back. You know, it was like, uh, if you went to church schools, you know those things. But I, so I won't go there. But anyway, so uh, so I was talking with friends who were saying, and, and I, I've been, I was in Washington for a number of years. We, we weren't in the same circles, I don't think. <laughs> Periodically in the same building, but yeah. for, for different reasons. Um, and uh, and there, were, there were protests against NATO, and there was a big one some years ago in Chicago. And I remember going to that, and, and, uh, and what I was most struck by was thousands and thousands of people who were there saying no to NATO, but police from all over. I mean, there were, there were police in brown shirts and blue shirts and white shirts and green shirts. I mean, it was amazing. And, and what was particularly striking in light of what we've seen recently in the D.C. area is, um, is it was totally peaceful. Uh, the protesters were totally peaceful. And so those are my recollections of, of, of NATO. And so what did NATO do? Well, we know it was in Bosnia. We know it was in Libya. Uh, NATO forces came to Afghanistan and all over the world. And, and then I thought, well, this is interesting. NATO, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, you're not going to get out to the Pacific, uh, not, not to the Hawaiian part, where, where right now NATO is involved in the RIMPAC exercises, which happens in the Pacific Ocean off Hawaii every other year. And they do things like blow up boats, big vessels, just to show that they can. So, um, so anyway, this is, NATO is, has expanded. In fact, they're calling themselves now the 360 because they really want to be everywhere. Um, I love what Vijay Prashad wrote about NATO, because I, when I started thinking about it, I thought, hmm, NATO, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know? It's a what? A wolf, wolf. in sheep's oh. clothing. Okay. Uh, but then I read Vijay Prashad, and I loved his metaphor better. It was, um, NATO is the Trojan horse that the American empire is in. And I thought, hmm, I think he's got it. So, um, so here it is. It's this, this organization. So, so why didn't, when, when the Warsaw Pact in 1991, after, after the Soviet Union disbanded, and, and uh, the uh, Warsaw Pact ended, why didn't NATO say, well, good work, we won. <laughs> We're going home now to eat mushroom cookies. But no, 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 no. Somehow or other, I think they learned that, wait a minute, this is a cow, uh, not the holy cow, but the cash cow of, uh, of the military industrial world. And uh, so, so NATO expanded. Um, it was initially, it was initially a few countries who were all in Europe and in the United States. And it, and it had a very good, good underlying reason to be, right? It was, to, uh, to unify uh, Western Europe, to, uh, to stop the Soviets from coming further west, and, uh, and to, to, to help bolster democracy. And now it is everywhere in the world um, making, making relationships with AFRICOM. Africa, imagine, NATO in Africa. And, and they were so generous, they invited not only uh, their own people to come to this big conference in, in Madrid, but they invited Australia, New Zealand, Japan, 
And anybody want to guess? South Korea. South Korea, you got it. Bingo. Okay, so I think we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> no, but that, I'll just say this: that that I I see no reason for for um, for NATO. The question always underlying for me is, who benefits? And um, I, I'm not aware that anyone benefits except stockholders in weapons country companies. So I'll stop there. Uh, and, and invite you to, to yeah. join this, and then we'll continue on. Well, thank you to Robin and to you, Packy, for uh, <coughs> organizing this. Um, uh, I do have some notes, and I'll refer to them at some point. But um, my starting point is, um, I guess, with uh, Henry Luce, who had uh, hmm. Life magazine. Uh, back in uh, 1941, he, 40 and 41, he was writing about um, uh, uh, God uh, giving, um, uh, religiously, God giving the United States uh, uh, the authority or whatever to lead the, lead the world in getting rid of Hitler. Um, and that is probably the start in some respects of what some people have called the American century. That's my first point. The second point is um, it is no longer the American century. But an awful lot of people don't know that it is. Um, our, uh, our abilities are much constrained in part by what's going on in this country. Uh, in part uh, because our power is reduced as other countries have gotten, um, have, have developed uh, uh, stronger, um, uh, have, have developed much more and uh, have the ability that don't want to just be lackeys to do what the United States wants to do. So we have an enormous task here, which is uh, my, my third point which is how do we adjust? And we're in the middle of trying to adjust. Uh, and what has been a godsend for people that would like to resurrect the American century has been Vladimir Putin. Now, you could argue that um, something else would have come along if he didn't come along. But um, he, um, uh, he, is, he has, um, you know, he is, outperformed himself, shall we say. And uh, I don't know how you react to that. Um, uh, I do not think we should be seeking to uh, uh, resurrect the American century. I think we have to get beyond it. And um, that is very tough. A lot of people don't want to do that. And uh, a lot of people just turn their eyes away from what really needs to be done, which is to bring back some unity in this country uh, domestically um, on uh, what we do and, 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 and uh, where, where we go in, in, in foreign policy um, and in domestic policy. How we can unite this country once again around certain principles. We're, we're not there. and. I, uh, you, you see that, uh, frankly, uh, uh, daily. So, NATO was created after World War II, as you said, Packy, and um, uh, yes, it was uh, quite successful, and I think you, you acknowledge that as a deterrent uh, to what the, uh, uh, the Eastern Bloc, the Warsaw Pact, and the Soviet Union were doing. Um, uh, but the point is that um, in recent years, particularly because we can't get uh, people in the uh, UN to agree with us on, on problems that exist here, there, and everywhere, that we have sought to have NATO do a rump group in Libya, in Iraq, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, not for all wrong reasons, uh, but uh, they were all disasters. They've all been disasters, I'm afraid. Uh, 
Um, and um, uh, so, where um, uh, where do we where do we go from here? I don't know. I'd be interested in how everybody here 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 feels about that. Uh, but we, uh, uh, NATO is not the answer. I think that uh, NATO should should uh, not get into to, um, uh, issues that don't have to do with what was and what is now again probably a uh, core mission to be a deterrent in Europe. Um, the major problem is that, uh, let's face it, that the United States and Western Europe represents about 12 percent of the world's population. And the rest feels very differently than we do. Indeed, uh, the BRIC countries, B-R-I-C-S, that, uh, you know, ha recently had their, their own uh, summit meeting, uh, uh, includes uh, South Africa, includes India, con con uh, con uh, includes Brazil, con uh, includes China and uh, Russia's tagging along. Um, uh, I um, would argue that um, uh, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to change some of the way we behave towards uh, people, towards situations. Um, do not demonize people you disagree with. Uh, the absolute need to negotiate. Years, weeks ago, uh, I um, uh, was wondering why we have not been able to enforce a very good treaty that was made in 1923 called the Montrose Convention um, in order to get uh, address the problem of um, uh, grain exports out of um, 16% of world grain exports, I think, come from Ukraine. Mm. Uh, maybe 14% from, from Russia. Of course, Russia would like to combine the two and, and have it be its 30% of the grain exports. But at any rate, um, uh, why can't we get Ukrainian um, uh, grain out to places in Africa, the Middle East, and elsewhere. Uh, because if the Montrose Convention were working, and Turkey is a key oh. signatory to the Montrose Convention, it had to do with the time when Greek and Turkish populations were getting uh, separated and, and, uh, and the uh, Ataturk Republic of Turkey was uh, uh, coming forward. Um, and it calls for the, the Bosporus, the entrance to the Black Sea, to remain open. Um, what we should be doing, and I don't know that we're, I don't think we're doing it, but we should be doing it in this case, is trying to persuade uh, our, the Ukrainian government to um, lift the mines they put in so that the R Russians cannot get into other ports of Ukraine um, and get uh, some of uh, Russia's friends, ourselves included, uh, I mean, people that can negotiate with them, to get them to allow the wheat uh, to, to go out. And um, that uh, takes some hard diplomacy. It's much easier to give people arms than it is to do the hard, hard slog of, di of di diplomacy. And I'm afraid diplomacy is becoming a lost art in the greater scheme of things in the world. Uh, I'm, very di I'm very disappointed in that. But there's a clear instance where, where we should be doing uh, diplomacy. I frankly um, feel that we should try and go further uh, with diplomacy, and um, and that is to try and persuade uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainian government um, to um, uh, agree to to call for a ceasefire in place and the start of negotiations. 
that w something that we and the West could then endorse, because I think a lot of countries around the world might step back from what Russia's trying to do if we were trying to uh, move things to the negotiating table. Uh, it may well be in negotiations, and you don't get everything you want. Russian doesn't, Russia doesn't get everything it wants, and Ukraine doesn't get everything it wants. But um, that is, is, um, is, is, to me, a better solution than what we're doing right now, which is uh, having been not for totally prepared for a Russian invasion. Ukraine has been given some weapons, is getting more weapons, and is about in the process of trying to launch a counterattack. Um, which could well be partially uh, successful. A lot of people will die in the process, and uh, uh, that's something I think you uh, want to avoid when a significant portion of the Ukrainian population has already lost <laughs> members, uh, and a lot of Russian families have suffered through the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the way Vladimir Putin's handled the, handled the war. So uh, let's negotiate, let's not demonize, uh, let's try and uh, solve problems, uh, share, not dominate, um, uh, things that don't come naturally to a lot of Americans. I know that's a tough slog, um, but again, our, 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 our ability to run affairs of the world uh, is not what it might have been uh, some time ago. Um, and uh, a last thing which I regret from the early post-war uh, post period is that uh, a lot of what we were doing in the fight against communism is, um, is still with us. Uh, some of the people we supported um, along the way have uh, produced problems that uh, continue to fester. Uh, you can take Guatemala, you can take Iran, you can take um, uh, various other countries around the world where uh, Vietnam. Uh, it, it, to me, it is an absolute tragedy that Woodrow Wilson wouldn't meet with Ho Chi Minh, who came to Paris in 1919, that he could not get the attention of anybody when he lived in New York City in the 1930s. Uh, he was always a nationalist. Uh, yes, he was a communist, but he was always a nationalist, and um, he was. Uh, you, you, you see that in a lot of what's happening in uh, v v Vietnam uh, today. And I haven't done a lot of reading, but I, I have a strong suspicion. Uh, again, not totally wrong, but a bad reason for doing something. The one reason we um, froze out uh, Ho Chi Minh from the uh, Indochina conference in 1954, the Geneva conferences in 1954, and one of the reasons that we got into a war against them was because we wanted to prevent France from going communist. That's a very bad reason for doing something, but that is what I think is behind uh, what, what led to 50,000 Americans uh, uh, dying in, in, uh, in Vietnam. So. Sorry, that's rambling, isn't it? But uh, there's a lot of issues there. Un unpack yeah. them for me and tell me what you all think. But you, you should have a rejoinder to. <laughs> well, let me just say that I, I think we're we're uh, we're we're more unanimous uh, or unified in uh, in our in our um, con than we are pro NATO. But because I think one of the things that NATO doesn't do, and, and we're, you know, we're all pushing, or those of us here, I expect, are all pushing for negotiations anywhere, um, that, that we know what war does. And that question, again, is who benefits? And, and I, so I think, uh, you know, I, where, wherever we are, to, to look at how how we can use whatever leverage we have to say to those in power, uh, including our Secretary of State, who won't do this, but you you probably know him, so you could probably talk to him and say, "Come on, Tony, get with the program." Yeah, well, Eisenhower was uh, a president that uh, 
I did not agree with all the time, I guess, um, uh, particularly the Dulles brothers and, and what uh, they were involved in. But, um, uh, you know, Eisenhower was correct about uh, beware of the military industrial complex um, and don't let them run your foreign policy. And um, um, uh, there's a certain amount of that going on. Yeah. So, so not directly speaking to, to NATO, but to the, the larger context is to find those alternatives so that NATO is exposed as being irrelevant, that, that it's not needed. Got and a I, new lease on life for not a totally wrong reason. I mean, uh, a bad actor is what I would say. And uh, uh, you, uh, uh, that should be hopefully a short term problem yeah. that we can get beyond that. Yeah. So, so maybe this is a good opportunity to, to say, yes, go ahead, let's, let's open this to questions, comments. And you have one. I've been um, very bothered. Uh, I'm Eileen from Boston area, Eileen Kurkowski. I'm very concerned about the NATO countries that have shared nuclear weapons. And um, all of them, I, from what I gather, have signed the original NPT Treaty, 1970, 1968, and, uh, and yet the United States has plopped nuclear weapons, Italy, I don't know, 6, 60, and, and at least 16 nuclear heads, according to Luke. And it's against the law. And they had signed this agreement, and the United States has repeatedly push this into other nations like Poland most recently to also have nuclear weapons allegedly pointing towards Russia, but I think maybe China is part of that too. Um, could you comment about this nuclear stand that is part of, uh, well, the U.S. and uh, NATO? Um, frankly, I do not know, I, I doubt that there are nuclear weapons in Poland that we put there. Uh, check the sources. Uh, I mean, I... I, uh, I nuclear I, tipped heads on weapons, according to my readings. Yeah. Oh. Somebody else got that too? Uh, I was seeing... Chris Hedges was writing a recent thing about NATO, and he had... There was nuclear weapons in... in uh, in Netherlands, in Germany, in... Yes. In yeah. Poland. There was like... All, in Poland? All of, what? Oh yes, basically now. It was it was um, probably a week ago. Are these bombs or completed? I think they're I think they're tactical. They're tac bomb tips. Tactical what nuclear the, missiles. The tips are. There's a lot of depleted uranium uh, hmm. armaments out there, and I just I don't know, but I'm just. But they're nuclear. If, because my understanding is Germany is the main. Owner location of uh, American nuclear. I think it probably has the most. Yeah. But I, I would uh, see if you could differentiate between depleted uranium and... Uh, it doesn't matter. If the agreement says no nuclear yeah, development or sharing. You. And they signed this. And Who's they? All the NATO nations <coughs> signed this agreement yeah. in 1970. Yeah. And uh, there's, as you know, the review committee coming you, uh, well, Poland was not. Treaty coming up all next month. Yeah. I go to the UN for that. Yeah. But I, my proposal is to pass the TPNW, the newest what bill. What is TPNW? Uh, the Treaty on the Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons is the new kid on the block okay. to address the the biggest issue that the U.S. Has, and other uh, nuclear only nations have not followed to decrease the number of nuclear weapons that they've been avoiding that, sabotaging that since 1970. Well, we should not have gotten out of the, out of the um, uh, agreement we had with Russia to limit the number of nuclear weapons. Right. Um, but uh, that was, um, uh, President Trump did that. Oh, you mean Iran? No, 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 no. All of these. Nothing to do, separate from the Iranian thing. Yeah. 
Well, one thing on the nuclear weapons that I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about is that uh, I don't know whether Putin has made some offhanded comments about the possibility of using certain tactical nuclear weapons. And, and, yes. um, uh, but uh, the, the key thing there is that Putin, uh, Russia, was a signatory to an agreement in 1994 negotiated by our ambassador to Ukraine, William Green Miller, whom I knew, whom I knew very well. Um, uh, Bill Miller negotiated the withdrawal of all nuclear weapons from Ukraine. Right. And uh, uh, there you go. That's not a good message that would be countries wanting to have nuclear weapons. My understanding is that part of the agreement that was between uh, the Russians and the NATO countries, we've all heard this, is that NATO was not going to advance militarily toward Russian sovereign territory. And this was a signed agreement. And I believe it was then, was it National Security uh, Advisor Baker? Or I, I think he was involved then. Yeah. Uh, and, and he was became alarmed when that was broken, that there continued to be the militarization of the um, former Soviet republics. And there are periods in this history in which Russia has drawn attention to this and protested to no avail, coming right up right up to, to before the war. When, and, and I'm no fan of Putin, by the way. I would never want to live in his Russia, OK? But I'm just saying. Let's let's look at both sides of this conflict. Uh, there was no, never a signed agreement, but you're very correct that Baker felt there were understandings that we would not push towards uh, push NATO towards uh, uh, borders of uh, Russia, and um, uh, the problem has been that the. Some of the politicians that uh, won elections took over in, in, in Georgia, took over in Ukraine, um, uh, uh, have sought um, a deterrent against Russia trying to come after them again. Uh, what Putin likes to do in this situation, which he's done in several countries, is to continue to have some military presence as a check on the independence of, of the various countries. So in Moldova, you have uh, 3,000 or 4,000 Russian troops in one part of the country. In, 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 uh, Georgia, uh, in Georgia, you have two parts, North Ossetia and um, Ab Abkhazia, um, where there are Russian troops. Um, in, in, in Lithuania, you have, uh, etc., um, uh, a um, uh, an area on the uh, Baltic Sea where the Russians continue to have a presence. Um, it's all complicated, um, and nuclear uh, nuclear issues uh, are there, um, but uh, I don't think there was ever a signed agreement um, on on uh, on NATO um, uh, not coming up to. Um, uh, it's certainly the case, the, the big case being Ukraine. Excuse me. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there has been, uh, in terms of uh, the unknown written agreement, however, for 30 years, Russia has asked to be part of the new European security pact in the faith of Mark. I mean, in fact, ignoring Russia is in itself, I have to say, an aggressive act. That's one thing I want to say. Also, for eight years after the Navy coup, uh, and maybe even before, the U.S. and NATO countries have been training and arming Ukraine. Ukraine. Also, there was a civil war after the Navy coup where uh, Russian speaking people of the Donbass uh, opposed the uh, 
overthrow of the government and also oppose the uh, suppression of rights of Russian speaking Ukrainians. This was eight years of the Civil War. There were more than 14,000, uh, more than 14,000 Ukrainian Supposedly, Zelensky uh, had promised to be a peace president and to bring forth some kind of agreement to settle on the, on the border of Russia uh, a civil war that is still occurring, because there, there are several wars going on here, right? This still goes on. In the beginning of this uh, uh, incursion by Russia into uh, Ukraine, in the early months, there were meetings between uh, uh, Ukrainians and Russians. And the last most prominent meeting took place in Istanbul, I think that's there. And um, there seemed to be progress made, but then the US, and UK uh, negated these, these talks and wanted to push him for the continuation of, uh, of the war. So, I mean, I think it is so complicated and it is always presented from our point of view here in the United States as if Russia had no reason to worry about the military buildup in Ukraine, had no, no problems worrying. I mean, it was pretty sneaky, I admit, to, for, for uh, Putin to uh, acknowledge uh, the sovereignty or the independence of the Donbass and then use that as a ploy to go in to take action. Uh, but also, I thought it's pretty clever because we have done this in different parts of the world. So I think he's, lear he's learned very well from observing us, let's say, in Kosovo, for example. So I think my, my, my question is this. Why did Ukraine uh, uh, put all those landmines in the Black Sea, of course, to halt the Russians? But at the same time, why aren't they more eagerly wanting to give their grain. In other words, from my point of view, they can't. Uh, they can't get any ships in to take it out of uh, Odessa. Right, but if they're overland, if they can go overland to get the grain. I, I don't know whether they could uh, take it out by trains. But you right. can't get very much on. Out, right. Uh, but also, let me just ask you this: Ukraine. Um, when I hear Ursula von der Leyen at one hand saying um, Ukraine stands for European values, well that's new to me, really, knowing the corruption, the trafficking, etc. and so on, that are going on in Ukraine, knowing that Zelensky has silenced all opposition, like a military junta. And that at the same time, when von der Leyen speaks about, she started very early saying to Ukraine, we're coming, we're going to support you, we're all for you, and you represent the best of us. It will be the largest country in Europe, and yet it is not, it is not a democratic country. It is not a democratic country. So I would ask you, how or why is America once again, supporting a non-democratic country. What is our goal in it, according to your vision? I, I think it's a hell of a lot more of a democracy than Russia. Well, we're not talking about... Comparison. Well, we are talking about Russia because that's, uh, we, we, you know, Putin, Putin declared war on Ukraine. He says the Ukrainian people do not exist. I don't think he said that at all. Oh, yes, he, he said it several times. He wants a culture of eradication. Yes. I see. 
I mean, uh, he, he, um, I never heard him. Uh, well, I, it's, uh, oh, yeah. it's sad, it. and he, he was uh, a man with many faults, but right. Yeltsin, after it was chosen in the system, that right. uh, Putin would take over uh, from, from uh, Yeltsin. Um, Bill Clinton in uh, 2020, uh, sorry, 20, um, 2000, right. just before Clinton went out of office, mm -hmm. Clinton went to uh, Russia to meet uh, uh, Putin mm -hmm. and to uh, see uh, retired Yeltsin at his dacha. American ambassador at the time went with him. And what was very interesting to me was that uh, while uh, Yeltsin and Clinton were having a talk, um, Mrs. Yeltsin uh, was talking to the American ambassador. And the um, American ambassador said, um, how do you feel about democracy in Russia? Do you think it can survive? And at first, Mrs. Yeltsin wouldn't, wouldn't answer. Eventually, she said, they're back. Security services have taken over the country. That's, that's what she said. She said they're what? Police they're, they're, back. Back. They're, they're back. They're back. They're back. They're back. They're back. The security service. The Soviet police. The, the Soviet police. The, the KGB, whatever it was. However you want to. Um, and um, I, uh, 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 it is a mess. They both have history on their side. Um, and uh, it's not uh, something that the United States should be engaged in uh, long term. Um, the fact that they want to be part of Europe, the fact that they want to be freer um, than they would be if uh, they were part of Russia, uh, I, um, uh, I think that that's caught the imagination, their courage has caught the imagination of a lot of people. Um, but the problem will not be solved until their negotiations. I agree with you. Uh, Let me ask you one more quick question. Quick, because we've got a No, very quick, too. just yeah. one quick question. Um, uh, uh, Europe and America are arming uh, Ukraine, and it has become a cause celeb, mm -hmm. even with it for many problems. When I was in Bosnia and worked in Bosnia for many years, I often wondered why there was an arms embargo which affected the Bosnian Muslims and did not, did not give them a chance to liberate themselves against Serb aggressions or Croatian aggressions, while Croatia and Serbia held Yugoslav uh, 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 access to most of Yugoslavia's armaments. Why did we not, and Europe not, step in to allow, and for three and a half years, allow the destruction of a country is it because it was more interesting to see that part, the Balkans, disintegrate? That, 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 is, a, that is a fair question. A lot more attention is given to some problems than to other problems. Um, Churchill said so many things over his lifetime that I <laughs> disagree with, but uh, he did say once that uh, the Balkans generates more history than it can consume locally. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's marvelous that you spent some time in Sarajevo. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and there, um, uh, the Kosovars are a small group. They're united. Putin is, 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 that's one of his major things against the United States helped, uh, went against Serbia in order to let uh, Kosovo be created as a country. Well, I'm thinking about uh, Biden right now um, and uh, recalling, I believe, that at that time that Biden's son was doing a lot of work in Ukraine. If you look back 10 years, that Ukrainian was, that the U.S. was very involved in 
sort of supporting, pressuring Ukraine to become a, a capitalist country. Of this sort of backlash with Biden, where he's so supportive of putting weapons in Ukraine as a way of um, sort of saying that Russia's not going to be involved in our elections, and it's kind of a way for us to have a proxy war with Russia because we're using the Ukrainians in a way to fight Russia when we don't, the U.S. doesn't like Russia. And I, I, I'm not saying it's 100% of what's happening, but I'm, I'm wondering if there's some of that that's in the backdrop. Well, I have absolutely no idea. Um, Biden has a son who's had a lot of trouble in his life, and, and um, uh, at one point, uh, people were probably seeking to get close to somebody in the U.S. government, some oligarch in, in, um, in Ukraine, put him on the board of uh, trusted board of directors of, of, of a company that's uh, probably just as uh, bad and just as corrupt as every other company. Uh, that uh, was given something by somebody in the state, uh, probably before my dad. Uh, and uh, it was an opportunity for his son to, to, to make some money, to pay alimony or whatever. Uh, and uh, 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 it, it came a cropper a little bit, but uh, I don't, I, uh, I, I don't think that that was, uh, any, that meant anything to, um, it was part of a larger problem. It had nothing to do with, uh, with uh, Biden. Biden has uh, faults like everybody, but he feels over 50 years in Washington, he's heard so much that, from people in government that uh, was just totally wrong. And that's what led to getting out of uh, uh, Afghanistan. He just, uh, he would not hear any argument because he'd heard them all for 25, 20 years. He just, um, you know, he, he was uh, obsessed in his opposition that we, we, we uh, needed to get out. And I think he was right that um, uh, some uh, Afghans have been hurt in the process. Um, but in, in Ukraine, um, uh, it was the Ukrainians that uh, wanted to try and get a handle Corruption and the, uh, the uh, oligarchs, good and bad oligarchs, and so a good, supposedly a good oligarch, Poroshenko, uh, got elected, and um, uh, he wasn't able to take get a handle on it. He went through several prosecutors and didn't didn't get a handle on it. Um, I would hope that um, after uh, this, if the country of Ukraine survives, that they can get a handle on it. But they'll certainly lose a lot of support very quickly if uh, the oligarchs uh, take over. Could I jump in just for a second? Because I'm talking about Ukraine tomorrow. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. You're all missing the main point here, but everybody here who knows me knows what my angle is. <laughs> this is a major energy oh. war between two giant nuclear powers. Petro powers, Russia and um, Russia and the United States. I've got it backed up with the facts. The, the thing that's missing from this conversation is number one, Ukraine has the second largest natural gas reserves in all of Europe. Number two, the Donbass region is the area where most of them are located. So Russia has an interest in Donbass not only uh, because of the Russian-speaking people, but because there's huge money in there on natural gas. And uh, Burisma is a large energy company that was hoping to develop that natural gas in there, and along with Chevron and some of the other major oil companies. So if you look at the whole UK, Ukraine problem, not only currently, but you go back in time, then you're gonna, you're, everything's going to start making sense. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but I, I think it is a major reason. You've got, you've got to look at this, 
this part of the world from a geopolitical lens, which in the United States, uh, most people are still not used to. In geopolitical meaning, what's the territory? What's in it? What can we get out of it? How do we profit from it? That's a geopolitical analysis. And, and then I would add the, the uh, energy complex in there. And the fact of the matter is, is that there are major domestic oil and natural gas producers uh, who were, uh, into 2014, before the CIA-sponsored coup, which a lot of people do not mention, CIA-sponsored by Ms. Nolan and company. Um, and at that time, they were very anxious to get in on that. Uh, these are frack gassers producers. They also want to make a lot of money in Ukraine and uh, circumvent the Russians who supply 40% of the energy to Europe. So um, once you take it from this perspective, I think, um, the, uh, what we're having is the make making, I am arguing we could, could be into the mother of all endless wars. The endless wars over the past, uh, during the, our century, are about energy. I prove it in my book. And uh, this is just the, the horrific logical conclusion. And both sides are going to dig it because both sides want to control oil and natural gas. And oil, because it's the fuel of the militaries, it still is. They're the primary consumers of oil. And natural gas also because it, it feeds factories and heats homes and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's the great game on steroids. I'm sure you know what the great game is. <laughs> right, I, I Tony? I know what the great game is, but look, energy, energy is in the mix a very important issue. Not the only issue. Not the only, but more of a driving issue than people would suspect. And the reason they don't suspect it is because the media never covers it, except now. There's no choice. It's so obvious. It's so obvious. Everybody's scrambling around for their alternate uh, energy supplies, or they're going to be in deep trouble coming this right. winter. And, you know, poor, poor Biden has to go hat in hand to our enemies like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and so on. He hasn't got a choice. He realizes he's got to do that. Well, anyway, that's a <laughs> nothing focuses the attention like every time you've got to get gas. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and the, big, the big lesson from World War I and World War II for Germany. They can never again let their military run out of gas because that's the main reason it lost World War I and World War II. And once you start looking at these wars through, through an oil and gas lens, wow, it's just unbelievable. But, but as I'm saying, it's still sort of a national security issue because it's the fuel it of the military. National, it is a national security and issue, so it but there are get, many other... It doesn't get discussed in the media. Yeah, well, I, uh, I think it, it probably it does should. someplace. It saying, does a bit, but not as it should, in my humble opinion. Blinken has pro projected a long war. Who has? Blinken. It's Secretary of uh, uh, yeah. State. Oh, Blinken. State. Yes. Yeah. He's projected a long war. And of course, there would have to be a long war. I can bring up, by the way, purposely, Charlotte, I can talk about the natural resources because I knew you were going <laughs> so to, so I can so say true. that. But for over 30 years and longer, we've had our sights on Eurasia and the resources in Eurasia. Mm. And we have a long term plan to, uh, for, uh, under the guise of democracy, Who's more dem democratic and not democratic? I can tell you, I saw what uh, what NATO uh, did and didn't do in, in, in the Balkans. I saw what the uh, so-called uh, importing democracy, uh, the chaos it created. Uh, we have used uh, this uh, importing of democracy and uh, who is more democratic, who's closer. But now we're in a new time, as you have so well said. We're in a new time. And uh, we, we're, we're a small part, you've even said that, we're a small part of the globe of uh, uh, the right. West. Right. And a uh, new time is here. And unfortunately, it came through this lens. But, but I think it has been in play for a very long time. And you know Brzezinski's book, the great uh, chess game. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he ha he spoke about using U Ukraine as a bulwark 
into Russia a long, about 30, you know, 30, 25, when did you write the book? 25 years ago. And even longer than that, um, UK, uh, in uh, uh, 1906, had appointed itself and America as the bastions of democracy to, uh, to overtake uh, the Eurasian Peninsula. This is a long story. Robert, did you want yeah, to say I'm sorry. certainly lots of history there, but um, getting back to today as, um, right. as a peace activist, okay. I have been so appalled by all of Congress moving forward to a man, to a woman, to support 40 billion dollars of weapons to the Ukraine. And of course, one of the big questions is where does that actually go to when it gets there? But how could the, um, how could they have thrown aside all of the, uh, the other issues, the other major needs that we have here in this country and being willing to to uh, spend so much money there. And I, I want this to be a question, which is, I think this is going to be a terrible defeat for Biden because uh, because we will be facing the lack of, you know, proper health care and the homelessness issues and so on. And people will be looking around and saying, why? And actually the Republicans are more against the war than the Democrats now. And I can't believe I would ever vote for a Republican, but at the moment I'm feeling headed in that direction. Well, um, we're going we're gonna to see, uh, as I think I indicated, a Ukrainian offensive in the next uh, few months. My judgment is it will have limited success um, and will have a stalemate. Uh, but I do think the time has come to try and move it to the negotiating table. Um, and uh, we, 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 we should do that. But I must say that our problem on health care in this country, um, that is, a, uh, I think, a partially, mainly a problem, because the Republicans won't vote for anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of our domestic issues are tied up. Uh, why haven't we done more with, uh, with uh, renewable energy? Yes. That's a mansion. Yes. Mansions so much. Well, uh, you know, whatever. Indebted whatever, to, uh, to the energy companies. Uh, the, it's each one of these issues has somebody. Uh, uh, you talked about homelessness. Why can't we do something about child care? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why can't we, uh, I mean, it just, uh, well, anyway. Let, let, me, let me just join something. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you, no, no, no. This, you I, I mean, this is one of the things that I love about conversations. They, they evolve. And the, the topic evolves, and, and we hopefully get deeper into the, our understandings. Uh, the good news is we are such a small percentage of the population of this planet. And the global south is rising. And so um, I know, we, you know we're, we're, we're mostly white North Americans, so we think that we're the world. but. Uh, thank you for reminding us what a small percentage of this planet we, we are. are. This, <laughs> this, us, and and so 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 take courage, and um, and and let's pay attention to what is happening in the global south, and in and in India. Yeah. Um, you know that that I you know we can become so so Amerocentric or Western centric. We we think that we are we are in charge. And, and the reality is, as we face the climate right now, is we're not in charge of a damn thing. And, uh, and so this helps break that, that illusion. And, uh, and so, I, so I think it's, it is important to, to be aware of the real politic. But it's also important to be aware of change and the potential we have and to, to really utilize that, you know, to to, I mean, as I was listening to you and to, to others talk about the, 
the, the NATO, I think, yes, so, so NATO will become obsolete because Hopefully. Its, its utility is war making and most of the, the world is waking up to the reality that nobody wins in war. Especially with nuclear war, certain people well, do win. With any war, but nuclear war, it's it's over, and uh, and so so uh, so I appreciate this, and I, I particularly appreciate it. Thank you, Robin, for for inviting Mike, because I I really appreciate the vantage point you have with your your years of experience being one of the insiders or or in bed with the insiders in those affairs and relations, you know. Uh, we, were, we were chuckling <laughs> before. Uh, you have the House Foreign Affairs Committee, you have the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Senators have relations, congressmen have affairs. That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and our, our Mike Van Dusen has been in both of those houses. So, um, so we want to thank you for yeah. staying yes, alive <laughs> and, uh, and, and sharing the that the information you have just by being where you have been, that many of us don't. Well, you know. it's very important that you stay active. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't know that NATO is going to have much of a future beyond uh, um, Europe. It certainly should not get involved in, in, in uh, problems here, there, and everywhere. And uh, if we can't get the UN to, to do peacekeeping where it might be needed, um, uh, well, we have to find a way of doing that. And uh, that means getting, getting the Global South involved in it, uh, leaders in the Global South. It means uh, uh, being able to do it in such a way where it's, it's very, um, uh, uh, where, where China or Russia can't uh, veto it. And uh, I think you can do that in a lot of instances because they're very conscious of their 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 role in the globe. And if they uh, um, they uh, uh, China in particular wants stability everywhere uh, because they they think that's best for them. Um, and um, uh, at some point they're going to see that. Uh, Ukraine is not a winner. I mean, being against Ukraine, trying to get rid of Ukraine is not not a winner. At least I hope they will. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. If there is someone who hasn't spoken, has some hot uh, question to ask or uh, whatever, um, I think we've had a very fruitful conversation. I want to thank both of you and, and the audience here. I think. There's something like uh, 20 people who turned up, so this is wonderful. Yes, I would, I would yeah. say it's very funny. You're looking at the two of you, and behind you is an American flag and a Ukrainian flag flying. <laughs> and, and it's just, I can't get past that. Uh, that uh, okay. Uh, can I make a recommendation? Yes. I think it's going to pour soon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, hint, they hint. have been saying that all, all day. day. Yeah, but it hasn't been <laughs> rumbling <laughs> until now. <laughs> so, yeah, all right, so we have to move the chairs so, back so into in the, the but, library there. Okay, so, so in, in anticipation of this, I, uh, I made something for you. <laughs> oh. uh, I, uh, to Michael Van Dusen recognized as a good insider, the champion of Mickey Matt, and that is... For those of you who know Ray McGovern, do you know Ray McGovern? I know him. Yeah, yes. well, yes. the military, industrial, congressional, intelligence, media, academic, think tank complex. <laughs> Here you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, good luck to everyone, and we've had several people. Barbara. Now you're Barbara. Yeah. Leslie. Yeah, Leslie. Hi, Mike. Yes. From Rochester. Chris from, uh, well, from next town, Hancock. Yeah. Hancock. And Thank you folks. for coming. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, those are pretty ominous looking pods up there. Wow. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, our gardens it's need it. It's taken a long time to get here. <laughs> it certainly has. Oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs>